afternoon, my conscious co-creators. Welcome to another edition of the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. I am very, very pleased that you are all here with me today. Hmm, getting some weird static there. Before I begin the show, just I want to give a quick shout out to all of my dear friends, soul family, sisters and brothers from the Evolutionary Business Council. We, I was at the... Uh, annual retreat this past weekend in San Diego. And it was so good to see everybody. Um, many dear friends who have had on the show in the past, um, people like Teresa de Grobois, Jennifer Huff. Um, and after three years of purely meeting virtually to finally meet in person, it was a real treat for me. And uh, uh, I just really want to give a big shout out to the organization um, so thank you all for tuning in today. I've got an amazing, wonderful guest that I'm really excited to bring on. But first, of course, uh, let me uh, start off with uh, my little quote from or little section of my book, Everyday Awakening. And this section is called, We Can Be Right or Happy, But Rarely Both. We never really win an argument. No matter how hard we try to convince the other person that they are wrong, they only dig in their heels. If anything, they will only be more convinced they are right. And if by some miracle we do get them to concede that we are right and they are wrong, they will remain angry at us. If we lose, we lose. If we win, we lose. Perhaps because we are playing the wrong game. Maybe what we should be concerned with is not winning, but being happy. The old adage is, you can be right or you can be happy, but rarely both. If we change our focus from winning to being happy, we can play a totally different game and play in a totally different way. Because now it is not about the end result, but about how we play. When we give up our need to be right and focus on our desire to be happy, we can joyfully skip down the road. We can let others have whatever ever opinions they want to have. As long as we're happy, who cares? Being in a joyful place will cause others to wonder, why are we so happy? Maybe then we can start a movement and they will also give up the need to be right and focus on being happy instead. That is how we all can win. So let's stop playing the win-lose type of game and learn to play more win-win games. After all, aren't they much more fun? So, um, you know, this section of the book I wrote, and, and and we've all heard it a million and one times over and over again about being right versus being happy. And and it just was reflecting on it. And I, I felt the need to share it again, even though it, it's been talked about so frequently. But still, I find people who... They, they come to me and they're having a, a problem talking with a friend or family member. And, and it's like, they just so want to be right. They so want to convince the other person that they're right. And they're and the other person's wrong. And I keep trying to bring them back. I'm like, is it making you happy? If it ain't making you happy, why are you doing it? I was like, look, we don't have to convince anybody else of anything. Whether they believe the same thing we do or not, it makes no difference to how we feel. It is purely an inside job for us to work on feeling happy. And we don't need to convince anybody else of anything in order for us to be happy. It's actually our natural state of being. And in that case, we don't need to do anything it's just about learning to tap into it and learning to be in alignment with that natural state. And so I just felt it was important to uh, bring that awareness back, bring the conversation back to this idea of being happy and not worrying about being right. Because especially in today's world where we're so divided and everything's so polarized, 
I just kind of feel that when we're focused more on just following our bliss and our joy and learning to be happy of where we are in the present moment, that then there's less for us to fight about, less for us to argue about, less for us to convince other people about. It it just makes life all that much easier. Anyway, I'm not going to go on about it because I could go on for a long time, but I really want to bring on my guest. That's the section from my book, Everyday Awakening, which of course you can get at everydayawakeningbook.com. And the title is We Can Be Right or Happy, but Rarely Both. All right. Now, it is my extreme pleasure to bring onto the show uh, author, teacher, host, conference organizer, speaker, and ceremonial facilitator, Stephen Gray. Stephen has been traveling spiritual and sacred medicine pathways for close to 50 years. He's not a beginner at this. He is a writer, educator, podcaster, psychedelic conference organizer, speaker, and cannabis ceremonial leader. Stephen is the author and editor of three books, including the popular Cannabis and Spirituality, an Explorer's Guide to the Ancient Plant Medicine Spirit Ally, uh, Ancient Plant Spirit Ally, and the brand new book, How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World, Visionary and Indigenous Voices Speak Out, which I have right here, and we're going to be talking all about that today. And for the past 10 years, Stephen has been the creative director of the iconic Spirit Plant Medicine Conference in Vancouver, Canada. Since 2020, Stephen has been interviewing leading influencers in psychedelics and consciousness transformation for the Stephen Gray Vision YouTube channel and on all the various podcasting apps. And Stephen, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the Conscious Consultant Hour. Well, thanks, Sam. Happy to do this with you. My pleasure to have you here. So um, I guess I just want to start off. I've, I've been reading the book, and and I'm just curious, why did you decide to put this book together? And I, and I should also point out that this book, it, it's it, it's not just your writings, but it's a whole bunch of different elders and, and visionaries who've all contributed their voices to this book. What was it that kind of got you to feel like, I, I need to put together a book like this? Yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for asking it. Uh, and uh, yes, there are 25 contributors, by the way. And um, I only wrote um, an intro and a conclusion and another chapter that I mostly wrote. Um, and then I gathered some quotes together in another chapter. So it's mostly the other, the, the 25 contributors. Um, well, um, you know, as the as your bio that you read about me indicated, I've been around this kind of work for a long time. I've uh, been involved in spiritual practices and so on, you know, since I was in my, you know, maybe a 20 or something like that. Uh, and it's increasingly dawned on me, I suppose, in recent years. Uh, I've uh, that we have reached a, a nexus point, you might say, um, <clears throat> uh, a crisis point on the planet that's been mm -hmm. coming for a long time. Chris Beige, who I specifically put in as the first chapter after the intro in the book, um, you know, we could spend a whole hour just talking yes. about Chris's experience. Um, yes. But maybe I should just give a sort of like a hopefully about a one minute background on him. Mm -hmm. He's a retired professor of religious studies and philosophy from uh, Ohio State University who undertook a 20 year, what turned out to be a 20 year journey following the Stan, Stanislav Grof protocol for how to do private, um, you know, uh, inward journeys with LSD. And he did that 20 times over this, uh, pardon me, 73 times over this 20 year period on high dose. High dose. LSD. Yeah. Yeah. And in every one of those, according to his own account, he broke through, you know, all the ego death stuff, even species ego death um, stages and broke out into what he has variously called the vast intelligences of the universe. And um, many amazing things happen, but especially for the purposes of our conversation, the last third or so of those 20 years, um, he started to receive increasingly focused messages from these intelligences that we are entering into a death and rebirth cycle as a species. Um, and that hundreds of thousands of years of developments of various kind and karmic development and so on uh, have reached that point now. And so it behooves uh, as many people as possibly can to pay attention to that 
uh, and to uh, wake up to what, uh, I, th- I forget what term you called it, I like to call it our true nature, natural self, you called it in mm. your intro there, um, and participate in that healing, uh, in that uh, transformation. So that's been dawning on me increasingly over the last few years. And as you mentioned, I've been involved with this conference. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that it's all focused in that sort of general area. That's all. Uh, I'm kind of like the the more like the vision person for the conference. And I, I find speakers and so on. And, and for me, uh, anything to do with psychedelics is most useful when it's uh, somehow not every speaker has to be focused on this bigger picture, but at least some of the speakers need to be fully aware of and in some fashion, directly or indirectly, addressing this, you know, this central issue for humankind. In fact, our subtitle for this past year's conference was The Role of Psychedelics for a Planet in Transition. Mm. Um, so, so that's, you know, I've been moving in that direction for quite a while. And, and, uh, I, and, uh, as far as like 14 of the 25 contributors are people who have spoken at the conference. So I already Mm. knew a lot of these people. Um, and so it wasn't that hard to gather them together. Uh, um, yeah. So I just thought, well, you know, I already have this kind of head start with these connections with so many Mm. people over these last, well, now it's almost 12 years. Uh, this will be our 12th. Um, actually okay. 13 years, but 12 conferences, we missed a year in the pandemic. Of course. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, um, so yeah, so it wasn't that much of a stretch to, you know, Hey, you know, so-and-so would you like to contribute to this book? Here's the mission. And I, I'm curious with the conference, um, how many people attended the first year and how many attended last year? Oh yeah. Good question. Uh, well, it started small. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, it's uh, yeah. It started small. I think there was only like seventy to seventy-five people the first year, mm-hmm. and then it gradually grew. And then um, we made a big jump in twenty eighteen, where we moved into a bigger room because we'd outgrown the smaller room. It's all always been at the University of British Columbia, uh. Uh, and we moved into this much much larger room and expanded a lot. We got. Uh, I always have a partner doing this with me and Mm -hmm. that person gets to do all the stuff I hate doing, particularly I don't hate, but you know, like the (laughs) social media, the ticketing, the social media, all those kinds of things. Um, uh, And so um, the guy that stepped in in 2018 up the level quite a bit. So we went uh, up from about the year before that, I think we only had about 250. And then the next year in the big room, we jumped up to about 500. And then in 2019, up to, uh, mm. or pardon me, 400 or so, no, 500, and then closer to 600 in 2019. Mm. Um, and this year it was down a little for a number of reasons that I don't want to bore your audience with at this right, point. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, with the pandemic and things going yeah. virtual and stuff, of course, it's it's uh, a little a little different. At all conferences, the attendance is a little different. But uh-huh. I, I just wanted to get the the sense of like kind of the the level of interest and how many people are now focused on this because twelve yeah. years ago, thirteen years ago, people weren't talking about it that much. Um, but over the last, especially since Michael Pollan's book, I think, I think oh, yeah. how to change your mind, like really open up the conversation in a much bigger way. And I remember I go to the horizons conference, which is here in New York city. I'm aware of it. And, and I remember, you know, one year going and like, it was mobbed and I was like, how come there's so many people this year? And they were like, Oh, was Michael Pollan. And he was like, and they were like, yeah, we call all these new people pollinators who haven't been around the industry for a while. I thought that was kind of yeah. funny. Anyway, yeah. it, it's time for us to take our first break. So, so let's just hold it there for a moment. And when we come back, I want to ask you about some of the different contributors and why you selected. So you already mentioned, you know, many of them were, were uh, speakers at the conference, but, Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of them uh, talk about psychedelics in the world from different angles and different perspectives. So I'm just Mm -hmm. curious sort of what went into that sort of selection process. Sure. Okay. So everybody, please stay tuned. Uh, Oh, and a big welcome to Patty from Tucson. I see her on the, 
the Facebook Live. Um, you're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour Awakening Humanity. We do this every Thursday, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time here on talkradio.nyc and on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on KMET in Palm Springs, California, and all over your, your favorite podcasting platform, Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, wherever there are podcasts, you're going to find us. So everyone stay tuned. We'll be right back in just a moment. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your conscious consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We're speaking this hour with author and editor Stephen Gray of the book, How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. Um, so, Stephen, as you mentioned, you have 25 contributors to the book. Um, you mentioned oops, uh, um, Chris, uh, Beige. Chris Beige, uh the Zoe Helene, uh, Dwayne Elgin. Um, I'm, I'm just pulling out some of them. Uh, grandmother, uh, Maria Alice Campos, Freyer, Freyer, Mar- Mar- Martina Hoffman. I, I mean, uh, Wade Davis, who's a PhD. Um, I, I mean, just so many different people, uh, and, and really uh, who touch upon psychedelics and different things from, from a lot of different angles. And so I'm just curious why you have such a wide variety of contributors, a wide variety of perspectives on this, you know, what were you really trying to achieve by bringing all these very diverse people together? Well, I think you pretty much said it. I wanted a wide variety of voices. Um, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I wanted to make sure that, I mean, I feel that, uh, you know, kind of goes without saying almost that uh, uh, voices of women, very important. So I tried mm-hmm. my best to you know, get as many, uh, female in, in you know visionaries etc as possible um i wanted uh um i i've always i've long felt that um indigenous understanding is essential for um finding our way forward and reconnecting to balance on the planet and so i sought out people like that and i just asked other people like um Ailton Cranach, for example, he's uh, indigenous Cranachy from Brazil. It's a small disappearing uh-huh. tribe, but he's become a major spokesman who's spoken at the, the, the parliament there or whatever they call it in Brazil and that kind of thing. Um, and I was told about him by Jeremy Narby, who uh, I've had contact with. He's spoken at our conference a couple of times. He's the author of DNA and the Cosmic Serpent and a couple of other really interesting mm-hmm. books. 
uh, he didn't, he was too busy with another book to uh, um, accept my invitation to write for the book. But I said I was looking for people from indigenous backgrounds, and I know he spent a lot of time in South America. So he said, oh, try Ailton Kranak. Um, mm-hmm. Similarly, with grandmother Maria Elise Campos Freire, she's one of the um, International Council of the 13 Indigenous Grandmothers, grandmothers yeah. um, and I have a lot of respect for what they've been up to. Uh, and then some of the Native Americans like Belinda Ar- Aracho, uh, people like that. Uh, so so I wanted that kind of, oh, and w- w- one of my favorite people, uh, I don't know if you got as far as reading his chapter, but um, I'm completely over the moon about this guy, Tyson Yunkaporta. He's a... Mm-hmm. He's a um, Australian Aboriginal, um, and he straddles different worlds. He's an academic uh, researcher, but also a, uh, a wood carver, and has deep involvement and connections with his traditional people of uh, Australia. And mm-hmm. he has a wonderful perspective. He has an, a remarkable book too, in my opinion, called Sand Talk. Mm. Yeah. So just, and, and as I said earlier, uh, I know a lot of these people already from the conference, Chris Beige has spoken mm. at it three times. Dennis McKenna uh. has spoken at it three or four times. Uh, Wade Davis has spoken there a couple of times and he lives nearby. And so uh, uh, that that's always helpful. Um, yeah, <laughs> personal relationship with Wade. Yeah. Anyway. Let, let, let me ask you in, in putting together all these stories, was uh-huh. there any one that surprised you? I mean, given that you're, you've been so steeped in this uh, culture for so many years, mm-hmm. was there anything that for you personally was surprising or did you kind of already have a sense of, of what everyone was contributing, going to be contributing about? Well, more or less, um, the one that jumps out is this same T- Tyson Yunkaporta, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> because um, although I had read the book, so I did know where he was coming from to some degree, uh, he has a, a very different perspective than many of the other people on the use of psychedelics. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, I don't know how you know how, how, how much detail I should go into here, but to to make it clear, uh, uh, he 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 talked about he. And I think it's in the chapter. Sometimes I forget whether it's the book, the chapter, or the interview I did with him on my YouTube channel. Um, um, he talked about doing a San Pedro, that's Huachuma also, mm-hmm. a Huachuma, uh, huge dosage, I guess, or it lasted 12 hours anyway. And he said it was about 15 years ago. And he said he got so much information from that from that one experience um, that he didn't feel like he ever needed to repeat it. Uh, mm-hmm. And like, for example, in his book, Sand Talk, there are these little visual symbols that he puts in at the beginning of sections and so on. He says that he saw those in that journey and then years later was taught those same symbols by a, an elder a wisdom carrier, uh, uh-huh. those same symbols that he had envisioned, you know. Um, so he, uh, you know, I, uh, anticipating this for some reason, intuitively perhaps, I actually brought up my little chapter synopses um, uh, thing here. And uh, I'd like to read you really quickly a couple of quick quotes from him. This is the opening line of his chapter. Before your trip, some information. We need to know how we got here before we go an inch further. We need to understand the rock beneath our feet before we go charging off to commune with the cosmos and orgasm across galaxies and all our transcendent splendor. And then there's another real short one, if I may, uh, Sam, Mm -hmm. uh, that that I think is important. He says, a lot of people today are tripping balls once a week, but they aren't in right relation and are Mm -hmm. stuck in an ecstatic loop of entropy. They have no tether to a place, no kin and no purpose for the work. So no work is delegated to them. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, that was, if you ask, you know, what was surprising uh, from some of these people, I'd say that was a little surprising because he's actually cautioning against, uh, uh, you know, a lot of repeated use, of, so to speak. Um, uh, and if you, you know, basically says if you didn't really get it, if you didn't do it right uh, the first time and get it, then just going back and repeating something vaguely similar isn't necessarily going to, you know, change your life or anybody else's. And, and I'm so glad you brought up that topic because it's a topic near and dear to my heart which for me, it's all about the integration. Like uh-huh. everybody, it's it seems to me that many people, not everyone, many people are chasing the big experience, yep. right? But if we don't take that big experience and then apply it to our day-to-day lives and use it to really change 
how we show up in the world, then it's really a, a missed opportunity. I mean, we might change a little bit, but I, I really feel the gold is in the journey after the journey. It's how are we living our life? How are we applying these deep insights and these deep feelings that we had during ceremony and really applying it to how we show up in the world and what we do when we show up in the world? Absolutely. You know, this is important uh, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, well, for example, let's say, let's, let's take a generous uh, suggestion and say that you do ayahuasca or something like that once a month. We're talking about like a five or six hour journey, right? So we're talking mm -hmm. about a total of 30 hours. How many hours are there in a year? So this yeah. is like, you know, 0.001% of your year. And mm -hmm. the rest of the time, as you say, you have to do the walk. Um, so mm -hmm. that's where the real work is. And uh, and so these these are in a sense visits. You know, Tom, the, the novelist Tom Robbins once said in an interview years after he sort of finished, you know, sort of seriously uh, working with LSD in, in his life and so on. Somebody said, "Do you still do LSD?" And he said, "Yeah, once a year for a reality check." You know, <laughs> um, so so you know uh, they have the potential value of showing you this larger what I would call as a Buddhist kind of a term unconditioned or unconditional mm -hmm. reality, reminding you of that. And that can be a change, a, a major change factor in a person's life. But right. then we have all these things that are so deeply embedded in our, you know, the, the ego that we've been putting together since the day we were born and, you know, most likely for quite a few lifetimes before that, uh, in a certain respect as well. Uh, we put together this, um, this self-identity, which Buddhist teachings, you know, refer to as an illusion that we are separate that way, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, the illusion of the separate self. But it, we're so strongly identified with it. Uh, it's so much our sense of, you know, kind of comfort, safety, coping, et cetera, that undoing it is really a lifetime's work, if not several lifetimes. Yeah. Uh, and so that's where your integration comment is quite important. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and I actually loved that passage that you read earlier that, you know, it's kind of almost about the grounding. It, it's sort of like when we're too much up in spirit and we're ungrounded, we actually can't fly that high. We fly a little bit above. But what I find is the deeper our roots are, the more mm -hmm. grounded we are, then the higher the branches of the tree can go. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, but if our, our roots are shallow, the tree's mm -hmm. going to get knocked over very easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, in my view, and certainly not my own, just mine by any stretch, of course, a, a major part of the, of the transformation, if you will, is uh, embodiment, embodying. Yes. Um, in a, I think it was in the cannabis book. I can't remember where I quoted it. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, French philosopher, priest, mystic, poet, whatever, um, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin sure, um, yeah. said something. I, I don't know if I've got the exact words, but I'm sure I got the gist of it here. He said, um, uh, physical energy must be mastered for spiritual energy to manifest. Um, mm. And, and, and by the way, so to speak, not quite by the way, it's actually central to it. Um, I think cannabis has a really important role to play. And that's why you asked earlier about, you know, what kind of variety I wanted some people to speak of cannabis. I got a couple in there, yeah. the Dank Duchess and Manelli uh, Eustacio uh, Costa. Um, cannabis, when understood, I think what I would call properly as a spiritual ally, as a spiritual right. medicine that deserves great respect and actually can be quite um, an advanced spiritual medicine in the sense that it's tricky to really know how to work with it. Right. It's, it's best abilities has an important role to play all in all this because it can open us up to land on what Buddhist teachings sometimes call what is um, mm -hmm. without all that going off into space. Although that can happen sometimes with stronger yeah. doses, edibles, etc. But for the most part, it's about embodiment, about coming back, grounding oneself, you know, um, yeah. I, you know, the Buddha, there's a lovely story from attributed to the Buddha where supposedly after his enlightenment, someone said, how do you know you're enlightened? <laughs> and he put his palm on the ground and said, this solid earth is my witness. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. All right. It, it, time for us to take our next break. When we come back, I actually want you to answer the question. How can psychedelics help us save the world? <laughs> okay. So sure. we're going to dive right into it. So everyone, please stay tuned. And of course, if you're listening live or you're on the 
the YouTube channel, um, youtube.com slash talking alternative. Um, feel free to post your questions and your comments there. We'll get to them all. I, I see Patty's pretty active on it. Um, but let us know what your questions are. So you're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We're talking this hour with Stephen Gray, editor of the book, How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. And we'll answer that question when we come back right after this. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be frank about health to advocate for all of us. Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy and Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Okay, Stephen, let's get into it. Uh, the, the title of the book is How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. So how can they? Yes, well, it's, a, it's an excellent question, of course. <laughs> um, first of all, there's two little words in the title that are married to each other and, and essential to it, and that is can help. Um, if the title was just um, how psychedelics can save the world, that would be a little too much, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can help participate. In other words, they're not the be all and the end all in some sense. The way I like to think of them uh, in a general sense, for starters, is that uh, when the um, when the, the illness is uh, reached an advanced level, you need oftentimes strong medicines. So there's you can, it's unarguable that uh, psychedelics are strong medicines, they are um, arguably when understood properly, and that of course is key, um, in the right hands, you know, from both sides, you know, whether it be guide sitters, ceremonial leaders, or participants, etc., they are um, certainly our most potent to, uh, tools that we have access to. Um, so they're really important right now for that reason. Um, I like to think that, uh, um, or I like to um, think of psychedelics as, you know, this is perhaps oversimplified to some degree, but it might hopefully be applicable as having two interrelated functions or approaches or angles or whatever. One of them is that it's, you could simply say it's a truth serum. They are truth serums. Um, and they're being used a lot for healing these days. And, right. you know, but, and it's like, you, you're looking, you, you see yourself in a sense, you know, I've, I've, I keep hearing that from people. I just, recently yeah, what, Dr. Dominic, uh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say one of the things that I, I hear a lot is, especially the first couple of times you, you sit with different plant medicines, they uh -huh. show you where you are at. Right. Yeah. So um, I just interviewed Dr. Dor, uh, Dominique Morisano recently. She's a, a psychotherapist who works with um, uh, ketamine a lot. And mm -hmm. um, she said, uh, it's ex it's turning out to be excellent for um, uh, for depression and also for substance dependencies. And right. she says a couple of sessions and people see themselves and they see what they're doing mm -hmm. and they want to change that. 
Um, I, I spent about a dozen years um, as a frequent participant in Native American church peyote prayer ceremonies. Mm -hmm. That religion is legal um, in the United States for mm -hmm. Native people uh, in particular. Right. Um, and why is that in a country that has been deathly afraid of mind altering substances, psychedelics and so on, you know, um, why is that? And it's because they were partly there because they, um, were able to make a case to the United States Congress that people, uh, suffering from drug and alcohol abuse and all kinds of other problems come into that teepee. They take that medicine in this incredibly powerful and safe container and they see themselves and they see that if they continue on that path they're heading for you know destruction death mm -hmm. and so they 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 change that you know so these medicines bring in that truth serum quality they bring in that um that uh, oftentimes that connection to the heart mm -hmm. uh and the other side of that that i was mentioning or it's hardly another side but it's kind of a concomitant com you know component of that is they also potentially, again, when they're understood and used properly, um, uh, 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 invite you uh, one into uh, a world that seems more real, that's like the ultimate kind of um, encompassing reality. This is uh, what people found in the uh, in the um, the Johns Hopkins studies where they mm -hmm. with end of life patients um, right with with psilocybin I think yeah and the results uh, that they you know the follow up results and all that they found that uh, many people had mystical experiences and the ones that had what you might call the most mystical experiences were the ones who changed their life the most and nice. their attitude right. about being sick so like they found out that when they went into these space this 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 space with the mushroom that they were in this living, divine, eternal, loving cosmos, and they are part of it. And in a sense, there's nowhere else to go. So you're safe no matter what on some level. It's obviously hard to explain to someone who hasn't experienced it. Right, right. That it eased their minds dramatically so that they decided, well, if I've got six months or a year, I'm just going to live it well. I'm going to treat my family well. I'm going to treat myself well, right. uh, you know, et cetera, right? Um, right. So, it, it's I was just going to say that is essentially the, a simple version of or an answer to how I think these plants and substances can help, you know, change or transform the consciousness of enough people that it can influence everybody else as well. Right. I've, I've heard it said that that um because I'm, I'm a member of an organization of transformational thought leaders. I mentioned it at the beginning of the show, the Evolutionary Business Council. And the goal of the Evolutionary Business Council is to empower 1,200 thought leaders to reach a million people apiece so that we collectively reach 1.2 billion people around the planet, which is roughly 15%, Beautiful. which many people have said is the tipping point for consciousness, that when 15% of the population, their consciousness has been raised in some way, that it creates a wave of, of a, a wave of change that that's unstoppable. Yeah. So the reason for a book like this is just that, basically. Right. Um, two, two, two examples, two little thoughts come to mind about it. One is a quote by Terence McKenna, which he borrowed and somewhat changed, updated uh, for the modern age. Um, uh, I think it comes from William Blake, but I'm not quite sure. But the way Terence put it was, uh, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. Mm. Um, and then there's Victor Hugo. So there's three little things there that are coming to mind. <laughs> um, Victor Hugo, the 19th century poet, etc., a novelist, said, uh, there's nothing as powerful in a, as an idea whose time has it's come. come. Yeah. And so what that ties into is this vision that's been under underway for quite some time from indigenous people, for example, for hundreds of years, that we have come to this point where the viability, uh, the plausibility, you might say, the supportability um, of the current uh, arguably dysfunctional trajectory of planetary affairs on the material level is not viable anymore and is becoming increasingly less viable and believable. And as that happens, as Leonard Cohen would have, did put it in his song, there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. It's in yes. So there are visions coming from indigenous people in particular and other mystics like Chris Bache in the book and others that um, as that crack opens up, there is a new vision coming in and it will be believed if it can be understood. 
uh, you know, if it can be communicated in a way that's understood, uh, easily easy to understand. And and Dwayne Elgin in the book, by the way, uh, doesn't even refer to psychedelics. He talks about a new story that has to be simple, it has to be right. plausible, it has to be easily understood, and it has to be compelling. Um, and yeah, like that. And and so I wanted to go back to Chris Bache's chapter, the the first chapter of the book, which is the birth of the future human. And, and one of the reasons why that really captured me is because I, I've heard a couple of times the analogy of the caterpillar. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like the caterpillar, when it gets prepared to go into its cocoon, will ravenously eat everything in its sight. Hmm. Like, like, like apparently, is, and you have multiple caterpillars, it's almost like they're destroying their environment. Sound familiar? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that is to prepare right. them to go into the cocoon where literally their own body destroys itself mm. to then turn into a butterfly, which eventually breaks out of the cocoon and flies away. Mm-hmm. And the analogy was made that maybe that's where we are as a human species, mm. that we're preparing to go into our cocoon to transform into our the our new the new humans mm-hmm. but but before we go there we're so destroying our environment we're eating everything um as a way of of almost preparing us and i kind of liked it because it's sort of a uh, optimistic view of things though there are definitely less optimistic view of things as well yeah yeah well um i'm well i'm not sure i would see it quite that way. There are lots of us that are, in a sense, preparing and doing the work that we need to do on the inner and outer level, hopefully, Mm -hmm. um, because without the outer level, I don't think the inner work means, you know, a hill of beans, really. Um, Who cares if one out of 8 billion people uh, is awakened if they're not um, helping others somehow, in whatever way they can. Um, But the... um, uh, the the aspect of uh, sort of chewing everything up, I think that's actually more because of this spiritual disconnect that has yeah. been kind of a dark cloud over the human experience for several thousand years now, for to a large degree. As the you know, you mentioned, I think it was in our before we got going on the program, you mentioned Philip K. Dick. Yes, um, he was quite a visionary. And uh, he had some interesting ways of talking about this, that basically in these visions that he received while he was in this altered state for three days in particular and another, I don't know, three months or so, um, he was downloading this kind of information, which basically said that the the evolution, the spiritual evolution of humanity kind of got shut down a couple of thousand years ago by the controllers, by the, what he calls the demiurge, the false God, et cetera, mm. of control. Um, and that it's now opening up again. Um, but it's mm. the people that have, that have, um, are chewed up the world. Well, we're all doing it on some level, of course, just yeah. by our, you know, participation in, you know, the use of material goods and so on and so on. Right. But at least, you know, not to sound like a, you know, superior, but really people like you and me and many others are aware of that and sensitive about it and, um, you know, suffering, suffering with it as well and wanting to see, understanding that we need a different relationship. We need to come back into balance, uh, you know, with ourselves and with the, with the planet and, the, and with spirit. But there are many people that are just, you know, happily digging up the Amazon or whatever and are not connected to that vision at all. Right. So they're in a cocoon that is not preparatory. And, and, and yeah, I, I know, like, for myself, <laughs> I just notice packaging. And I just notice like how much plastic is used. And then it's like it's it's used and then you can't do anything with it. I mean, yeah, you recycle it, but you're almost practically throwing it out. And it's like, can't we find a better way? Can't we find something different that's not going to stick around in our environment for thousands of years and get into the the water and the soil and then into mm-hmm. our food? I mean, they've already said that like there are microplastics in like everything we consume because we've just spread it around so much and it's that lack of awareness of how everything is interconnected that actually is coming back to hurt ourselves isn't it well yeah and again that's why um this change has to start from within 
because right. it, the, the, that would be, a, in my mind, that would be the, the, what you're talking about with plastics. That would be an easy change if the will yes. was there. Easy. Yes. There's lots of materials around that you could, and lots of ways to deal with that. You can make corn-based products, bamboo-based right. products, hemp-based products. Right. You make products that break down and can be used in your soup in a month, you know? Absolutely. Um, so the te- those are just the deep, the technical details of how to deal with the problem. The, the source of the problem is our disconnection. Right. It, yeah. it's, it's our mindset and, and, our, and our disconnect. All okay. right. Uh, we've got to take our last break of the show. It goes so fast when I have such wonderful guests like yourself. Okay. Um, you. So <laughs> when we come back, um, maybe let's do a little bit of prognostication and, and see where are we going with all of this, okay? Sure. Absolutely. And I see Patty on the face, on the YouTube live says she loves Leonard Cohen. So you can keep throwing in Leonard Cohen quotes. <laughs> I know you got more. He's All a favorite right. of mine. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, stay tuned, everybody. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. And we'll be right back in a moment to wrap it all up. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a moment. Hey, everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. So we've been speaking this hour with Stephen Gray, editor of the book and author, How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. Um, And for those of us who are conscious, we understand what you mean by that. But why does the world need saving? You know, (laughs) in in my my opinion, the world's going to be around long after we're gone. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it's a bit of a loosey goosey term, actually. Um, yes. uh, you know, there are probably more sophisticated ways to uh, to to say that same thing. Um, uh, maybe you could say that um, <clears throat> the the um, the mission is to uh, is again this consciousness transformation, um, and and you know the save the world aspect is actually to try to turn the trajectory of human affairs toward an awakened connection to all that is, you know, so yeah. that, you know, you mentioned this, you know, so many people can spread out to so many people, to so many people, to so many people kind of idea mm-hmm. um, uh, that, uh, that the message will be heard, so to speak, when it, when it's time has come, when people, enough people are open, you know, like that, as I said, you know, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. So, um, yeah, it's not when you say the world, well, the, as you say, the planet is going to go on regardless. But, um, I guess one way that I'd like to think of it is, 
you know, some people might find this a little woo woo, uh, you know, who cares, whatever. Um, uh, I'd like okay. to think that um, the creators, whatever, however, whoever they are, they, us even on some level, um, have put so much love and intelligence into this planet uh, as an incredible, absolutely incredible place. Just, you know, brilliant beyond comprehension, um, interwoven in unbelievable ways, living living intelligence in everything, in everything. You know, this is what, psych, this is one way that psychedelics can help save the world, actually, is that people, uh, you know, we were talking about plastic and all that stuff. When, when oftentimes when people take these substances, they feel a connection to nature in a way that they never have before. Um, they feel embedded in it. They feel the beauty and intelligence of the world. I mean, if you were to, say, even take a modest dose of uh, psilocybin mushrooms, you know, not one where you have to kind of lie down and be looked after, so to speak, or whatever, but just a light dose and go sit in a garden with bees and watch the bees for a while, You'd be moved to tears, probably, at the brilliance and the intelligence and the interconnectivity yes. of everything. So, um, uh, actually, and, and I this kind of got... brings up an important point because yes. so much, like the psychedelics industry right now, is getting a lot of press for its healing aspects, Absolutely. but there's that spiritual aspect of it. There's mm -hmm. that not healing of the mind or the body, but healing of the soul. Mm -hmm. that psychedelics is sort of uniquely designed for, I guess you could say. Yeah. Well, I think it's all connected. Um, we have to do the inner healing work as well. Like, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, uh, we've piled up all this, you know, crust, crusts, you might say, <laughs> um, based on, you know, wounds that we've, you know, inflicted or been inflicted on us uh, over the course of our lifetimes. And as I say, probably past lives as well. Just ask Chris Bache about that one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and so there's a lot to undo. Uh, we, we have, you know, these wounds, uh, everybody carries them to one degree or another, and yeah. they need to be brought to the light and released uh, to move on in a sense. Uh, so, so the healing work is all connected to the spiritual work. It's not really separate, I don't think. But right. the healing work is almost like what, you know, a metaphor you might use or an analogy is that the healing work is like getting your, you know, you've got this car that needs repair before you can take it on the road. Uh, the healing work is getting the car functional and getting it on the road. Uh, but the real journey, the the purpose of it is to get that car on the road. Right, right. Right? It's not to sit there tinkering in your garage for 40 years and polishing the car every day kind of idea, right? Right. Um, so um, uh, uh, now I forgot what the specific question was about that. Well, well, yeah, it's just about the, the idea of, of healing. Oh, body, yeah, healing mind, and spirit spiritual. And soul. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. So I think they're intertwined. And the spiritual part, that's why I mentioned a little while ago, Sam, that I see the psychedelics as having kind of two interrelated functions, which is mm -hmm. one is to show you the truth of yourself and where you need to heal and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is to show you that what you're healing into is the true nature, uh, you know, the enlightened mind, if you will, the true sense of who we are as people. And so uh, they are connected in that way. And so it's not a problem that Mm -hmm. They're focusing on the healing. And in fact, um, uh, so let me, we don't have necessary. much time left. Yeah, sure. I, so I want to just, just ask you one, mm -hmm. one other quick question, yep. which is at this point in time, are you more hopeful about the future? Are you concerned about the future? Are you pessimistic about the future? How, where do you see things going from here? Um, for the first two of those three, I'm hopeful and concerned. Um, I'm yeah. not pessimistic. And the reason I'm not pessimistic is because I um, I think I have some sense of the ultimate potential of human beings, mm -hmm. that we are, as the Buddhist teachings would say, awake by nature, and it's just mm -hmm. a matter of how we, f we find that, how we fall into it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think any other functional, any other attitude is functional, regardless mm -hmm. of how logical it seems that we're going to hell in a handbasket. I mm -hmm. don't think it's valuable to oneself or anyone else to remain in despair, depression and cynicism right. 
uh, etc. So I am hopeful. Um, uh, I believe in the potential. And this is the message that people like Chris Bache have been getting from the spirit is that we have, there's a, there's an extremely good chance that we are going to eventually uh, blossom into what Dwayne Elgin in the book calls a mature planetary civilization. Mm -hmm. But in the short run, I don't want to get too dark about it, especially at the end of our conversation. I suspect we're in for a, a lot of difficulty on the yeah. material level um, because of the climate and because of the sort of karmic uh, endpoint, so to speak, of the uh, dysfunctional disconnection that's often running the world with people at the heads of corporations and governments yeah. in particular, you know. So um, I think we're probably in for a really difficult time. And it's a, it's a shame we don't have another extra five or 10 minutes here because um, what's really important about that in a way and why a book like this hopefully will be helpful is that if you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, as a potential, then it's going to be much more difficult for you as a person going through these next few decades. Um, right. It's just going to look like um, uh, a, you know, a, a total disaster for many right. people. Right. Um, but right. there's this potential for transformation. It's going to bring a different way of being on this planet. It's going to be much more simple, um, I think, you know, materially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Stephen, it, it's been a pleasure having you. And I just want to put out the offer that I'd be welcome to have you back on the show. And um, maybe even for for your conference, if uh, you want, I can interview some of the speakers for the next conference. So um, okay. before we close out, um, let people know how can they find you? Where can they learn more about the conference? Where they can learn more about you? Yeah, and I would be happy to have a follow up conversation. It's a it's a relatively short time here with these, um, you know, um, ads and whatnot that you have mm -hmm. in. So there's lots more to explore if you're up for yeah. it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So website Stephen Gray Vision dot com S T E P H E N G R A Y. And I'm also um, uh, Stephen Gray Mush Together and then Vision on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Uh, the um, conference is Spirit Plant Medicine dot com. Uh, and um, the YouTube when is channel, the next conference? Uh, November 3rd to 5th in Vancouver. November. Uh, one thing okay. that's really special about our conference, I'll just say super briefly, is that we do put everyone in the same room. There are no breakout rooms. And so mm -hmm. it has a ceremonial feel. We even have a cannabis mm -hmm. meditation ceremony on the Saturday night. Oh, wonderful. Well, uh, I, I, I hope to, to be able to attend this, this uh, November. That'd be great. I hope you can, Sam. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for taking the time out to come on the show. We'd be happy to have you come back later in the year and continue the conversation. Maybe we can get you in like before the conference um, so we can talk about maybe some of the things coming up for the conference. Anytime, Sam. Wonderful. I'll be, I'll be in touch about that. Thanks and thank you, yeah. my loyal listeners, for tuning in. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you'd like to reach me after the show, you can always find me at sam at theconsciousconsultant.com or sam at talkradio.nyc. Um, don't forget, coming up at 5 p.m. today, Frank Harrison and his show, Frank About Health. And Fridays, of course, we have our business shows, uh, Philanthropy and Focus at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, followed by uh, um, Stephen Fry and his show always Friday at 11 a.m. And we will have some new shows coming on board, hopefully before the end of the month. Um, so stay tuned for that. Thank you all for tuning in. We will talk to you all next week. Bye bye. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? 
Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. 